Hi guys, my name is Tensor. Today we're going to be starting a new series of tutorials. The subject of these tutorials will be blockchains, and we'll be doing all of this in Golang. In the past, I believe I did do a blockchain implementation in Rust. With the Rust implementation, I just implemented the most basic ideas of the blockchain. With this Golang implementation, we're going to be implementing quite a few more features on top of those core features for our blockchain. Things like wallets and a Merkle tree, as well as a consensus algorithm, and a few other concepts as well. Also, rather than assuming that you know what a blockchain is and focusing on the language of Go, we're going to focus on the concepts of the blockchain and assume that you have some knowledge in Go. So fair warning, if you do not have any understanding of the Go programming language, I highly recommend you go and you check out my older Golang tutorial videos. They are about two and a half years old, but that does not mean that they aren't still relevant. Throughout this series, I also want to cover the Go module system. So this will be the main language feature that we cover inside of this tutorial. Now, originally with Golang, you would have to set up what's called a Go path on your computer. And this Go path was a path that pointed towards a set of folders where you built all of your projects. That is no longer the case because they've implemented a beta version of this module system that allows you to define where a module exists and also download dependencies and add those dependencies to a mod file, sort of like with a tool like NPM or like Elixir's mix tool. If you take a look at the command line here, I'm going to create a new directory called Golang Blockchain, and it's inside of this C Projects Go Projects folder. So to make it so that the application I'm about to write is recognized by the compiler, I'm going to type in Go Mod in it, and then I'm going to specify the name of the module that I want to create. In this case, I'm just going to call it github.com tensor programming backslash golang dash blockchain. When you execute the command, you'll notice that you have a new file inside of the folder. And this file is your go.mod file. You'll have a little declaration that just gives the module name for this particular module. Now we can go ahead and start writing our application inside of this folder, and we can even bring in third-party libraries. To give you guys a good idea of how the third-party library import system works with this Go module system, I'm just gonna write a simple program, and this actually comes from the Go module example code. So we just imported this rsc.io backslash quote library, which allows us to grab various strings and then print them out. In this case, we're just calling quote hello, which allows us to print out hello world, and we're putting it into the fmt println function. Now I can just go back into my console and run the application and you'll see that it will indeed print out hello world. Now notice if we go back into our go.mod file we now have this require block which contains the third-party library that we just imported. And if this third-party library already exists on your computer it will use that version of the library but if it needs to download a new version it will go ahead and do that when you execute the run command. So in my case the library already existed on my computer so I didn't have to download anything and so I just added it to this mod file and then ran the application. It also created another file called go.sum and this is a bit like a yarn.lock file or a package lock file in that it has all of the dependencies for the third-party library that we've brought into our application. As you can see, this is a pretty handy feature and I recommend using it for your Go projects from now on rather than just using the Go path. With that out of the way, let's get into the main topic of this video, blockchain. In a very general sense, a blockchain is essentially a public database that is distributed across multiple different peers. What makes this so revolutionary is that it doesn't rely on trust. Up until blockchain technology was invented, there were a lot of decent distributed solutions for technology. However, they kind of hinged on the fact that every node would be trustworthy. That is to say that every piece of data coming from each of your nodes has to have the correct data inside of it. With blockchain, however, one of the nodes could be producing incorrect data, or let's say 49% of your nodes could be producing incorrect data, and the database would be able to fix itself. Now, because the database doesn't need to rely on trusting the nodes, 
you can do a lot of really cool things with your blockchain. For instance, create a cryptocurrency or create some smart contracts. Now as the name blockchain implies, a blockchain is composed of multiple different blocks. Each block contains the data that we want to pass around inside of our database, as well as a hash which is associated with the block itself. To represent a block inside of Golang, we can create a struct which has a hash, a data field, and then a previous hash field. The hash field represents the hash of this block. The data represents the data inside of this block. And this can be anything from ledgers to documents to images and stuff like that. And then the previous hash represents the last block's hash. Having this previous hash allows us to link the blocks together, sort of like a backlinked list. That is to say that each block inside of our blockchain references the last block that was created inside of the blockchain. And we actually derive the hash inside of our block from the data inside of the block and the previous hash that's being passed to the block. And when our blockchain actually gets more complicated, we'll also add things like a timestamp, the block height, and a few other fields which also go into this calculation. Now that we have our block struct, let's create a method which allows us to create the hash based on the previous hash and the data. We're going to be using the bytes library, so let's import that. And then down inside of this method, we're going to create a variable called info, and we're going to use bytes join to join together the slices of bytes so here you can see that we call bytes join, and then we take a two-dimensional slice of bytes. We pass in b.data and our previous hash, and then we combine it with an empty slice of bytes. Then we can create the actual hash by using the sum256 hashing function on info. And this comes from the SHA-256 library, which we imported up here. And now we can just take the created hash and push it into the hash field for our block like this. Something to note about this implementation of our hash is that the SHA-256 algorithm is actually fairly simple compared to the real way to calculate a hash for a blockchain. And so we're just using it as sort of a placeholder for now to demonstrate how the hash changes as the data changes as we get further through this tutorial though, we will start to implement a more secure hashing function. Now that we can derive the hash, let's create a function that will allow us to create the actual block. This function takes in a string of data and then it takes in the previous hash from the last block and it outputs a pointer to a block. This function is actually pretty simple. We just need to create a new block using the block constructor. And of course, this will just be a reference to a block. For the hash field, we'll just put in an empty slice of bytes. Then for the data field, we'll take the data string and convert it into a slice of bytes. And then we'll take the previous hash, which we're passing in here, and just put it into the previous hash field. Afterwards, we can just call the derive hash function on our block and then return the block from the create block function. Now that we have most of the functionality that we're going to need for our block type, we need to implement a type to represent our blockchain as well. And we can do this simply by implementing a struct which contains one field which has an array of pointers to blocks. This array will work pretty efficiently for now, but as we get further into building the blockchain, we'll start to use more complicated structures so that we can reference our blocks by their hash and by their other values. With our new blockchain type, let's create a method which will allow us to add a block to the chain. So this method gets the pointer for our blockchain and then it takes in a data string. First, we want to get the previous block in our blockchain, and we can do this by calling chain.blocks, and then passing in the length of our blockchain blocks minus one. We can create the current block by calling the create block function, passing in the data string from here, and then getting our previous block hash and passing it in as the previous hash. And then we can append this new block to our blockchain simply by using the append function, passing in chain.blocks, and then assigning this to chain.blocks. 
You guys may have noticed that there's a bit of a flaw to the way that we've implemented this particular blockchain. Each of our blocks references a block before it. But what happens with the first block in the blockchain? Well, we need to create a function which will allow us to generate this so-called genesis block. So let's create a function which we'll call genesis. And then all we have to do inside of this function is return a new create block call with data that we want for the first block. In this case, I'm just going to put in the string genesis and then an empty previous hash, which is just a slice of bytes. Now with this genesis block function, we can just create a blockchain function, which will build our initial blockchain using the genesis block. Let's just call this init blockchain. And inside of the init blockchain function, we can just return a reference to our blockchain. And inside of it, we can create an array of blocks with a call to our genesis function. Now that we've done this, we can go ahead and go into our main function to put together the blockchain. So first, let's call the init blockchain and assign it to the chain variable inside of our main function. Then we can add some blocks to the chain by simply just calling chain.addBlock and then passing in the data that we want to push into our blocks. So first we have our genesis block, which just says genesis. Then we'll have our first block, which will say first block after genesis. Then our second block, which will say second block after genesis. And then our third block, which will say third block after genesis. And of course the hashes for these blocks will be derived by the information inside of the block and the previous hash. To actually see the blockchain, let's run a for loop and then take out each block one at a time and then print out each of the fields inside of our blocks. And we'll do it just by calling FMT printf on each of the fields. So first we'll look at the previous hash and we can use string interpolation to look at it. Then we'll look at the data inside of the block and we want to look at it as a string. So we'll use percent %s here. And then finally, we'll look at the blocks hash. Now let's go back into our command line and run the application. And you can see here, we have our initial previous hash, which is empty because this is the genesis block. And then we have the actual data inside of the genesis block, which just says genesis. And then the hash of this block, which is this big line of characters. And then you can see that the next block references this hash. And of course it has its own data, which says first block after Genesis. And then it has its own hash, which is derived from the previous hash and the data here. And that continues on for the other two blocks as well. Really quickly, let's just go back into the application. We'll comment out the previous hash so that we can clean up the actual data that we're looking at inside of the command line. Now we can go ahead and rerun it. And actually I've run it twice now. And you'll see that the hashes are actually exactly the same. So we've got our two Genesis hashes, which are both the same. We've got the two first hashes, the two second hashes, and the two third hashes. Now, because with a real blockchain, you've got multiple copies of the actual blockchain, the way that you find out if the data is corrupt is by comparing the different hashes and seeing how they've changed. So if I come back into our application and change the data inside of say the second block here, maybe change it to say second with an undercase S. When I rerun the application, you'll see that the hashes will be exactly the same up until the second block. And then once we get to that second block, they will be completely different. So here's the original second block hash. Here's the new second block hash. Here's the original third block hash. And here's the new third block hash. If this information was coming from one of our nodes, we could immediately go and say, all right, well, this node obviously is giving us bad information. Let's change it and revert it back to the information that it should have. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed the first part of this tutorial. Most of what we were doing was just setting up this framework for our blockchain. In the next few tutorials, we'll start to look at how we can set up wallets. We'll look at the proof of work concept. We'll look at Merkle trees and we'll look at some other concepts. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to subscribe and like. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night, guys.